Aloha. We're, welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's title is Mega GOP Set to Disrupt the Federal Government. Um, let's just go through some of the quick examples of what the mega GOP is up to. Um, number one, we all know that they're trying to impeach uh, President Biden. Doesn't seem to be, be a lot of evidence to back that up, but there they go. Number two, they're blocking all military promotions. Uh, that's uh, Senator Tuberville. Um, and that's been going on for some time. That is not helping the military one bit by leaving this, this void of promotions in, in place. Uh, they decry the law agencies, the FBI, the Department of Justice. Um, formerly, the GOP used to be very supportive of, of law enforcement. Not anymore, not with the GOP that's run by the megas. Um, they're trying to shut down our current government right now in four days, uh, trying to make sure that there's no passage of a continual budget. And that's, we'll see what happens by Saturday. Last but not least, uh, remember when they tried to uh, stop the federal debt, the federal government from paying its debt obligations, the federal ceiling, they tried to stop that. These are just a few examples of what the mega GOP is up to, uh, the wrecking ball of the GOP, I call it. And with that, I have my co-host, Jay Fidel, and we're going to discuss this topic. Good morning, Jay. Morning, Tim. It's a, a topic that should scare all of us. Because it, when, it, when you draw the line between all those things you mentioned, I mean, some of them have a little hope, most of them have no hope. Um, when you draw the line between them, you connect the dots between all those things, what you get is a, a group of people uh, who are, are, are kidding around. It's, 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 it's a disaster. They're, they're like teenagers, adolescents, pubescents. And what they're doing if you connect the dots, is they're trying to disrupt and destroy the federal government um, in some kind of bizarre, um, you know, mis misguided attempt to advance some kind of ideology, although it's hard to say what that I ideology is because a lot of the pieces you described, they're inconsistent with each other. The thing is, you know, the bottom line is it, it's, it's destructive. And, you know, I'll tell you, when, when I think about that, I think that January 6th was not the last attempt by this bunch of clowns um, to, um, you know, turn over the election to destroy representative government and democracy in this country. Um, and now what I see when I look at the Capitol building, as I see the same thing happening within the chambers by the people who were elected to you know, develop public policy um, and, um, you know, run the country. Uh, and what they're doing, Tim, is they're having another insurrection. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of insurrection, but it's actually more dangerous because they've stopped everything. They're standing in the road on all public policy, and they are not to be forgiven for that, but that's what they're doing. I guess you could say that they're also trying to bring down Biden in the same way that the insurrection tried to bring down Biden. So what That's we have, in my view, is a continuing insurrection. This is a little different, but it's the same idea. Well, I think that's a great point. And let's look at the driver of this clown car, since you referred to him as clowns, and you're not the only one who has done that lately. Uh, let's look at the driver of the clown car and a, a willing participant in this. And that's our, um, the driver is also known as Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, he's quoted to say this recently. This is a new concept of individuals that just want to burn the whole place down. Wow, pretty forceful comment, I think. Uh, very responsible to say something like that. Uh, yet, today, we know that the Senate has passed a continual resolution to keep the government open for the next few weeks to they work out all these differences. And what does Kevin Carthy, the driver of the clown car, do? He's telling people he swiftly rejects the uh, Senate budget proposal, and he won't even allow it to hit the floor for discussion or debate. Now, I don't know. <laughs> which, which Kevin McCarthy are we dealing with here today? The one that says this is a bunch of individuals trying to shut the government down and imply that they're irresponsible? Or for being the irresponsible clown car driver that says, let's shut down the government? Well, you look at the effect of what he's doing. And he's trying to shut the government down. Now, the reason, I think, for Kevin McCarthy may not be the same as the reason for some of the others. Kevin wants to hold on to his uh, his job as a speaker. 
and um, his group, the, what do you call it, the, the Freedom Caucus, um, the, the, the really right-wing ultra-conservatives who are somehow running the House, um, are telling him to do that or he loses his job as Speaker. <clears throat> what I find interesting is his job is more important than the country. Uh, I guess he gets a lot of perks and benefits by being in that position. Maybe he enjoys the, you know, the ostensible power. But in fact, he's only doing it for his own self-interest. And so Correct. that's why you get this inconsistency between what he says and what he does. Well, it's you interesting. Have look, you have to Go look ahead. at the Freedom Caucus and who's there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what, what the mechanics are in the Freedom Caucus. You also uh, have to look at the other Republicans in the House who form the majority in the House. They're letting those guys do it. They're going along as they have in the past. And so you have the, 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 uh, the crazy clowns running the clown car, and then you have all the other clowns sitting on the sidelines letting them do it. And that points a, a huge accu accusatory finger um, at the Republican Party, at the GOP. It's not just the clowns. It's all. True. Well, you know, you mentioned the uh, Freedom Caucus, and right now the Freedom Caucus consists of about 20 members of the House. And um, there's about 200 um, non-MEGA GOP uh, representatives in the House. So you have 20 holding 200 hostage, but not just the 200. Um, you have 20... And of that 20, about five of them, Matt Gates, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Boebert, and uh, Andy Biggs, you, you have a few of them that are holding the entire nation hostage. I'm not talking about just Democrats or independents, but also other uh, Republicans hostage by this uh, insistence of shutting down the government, not because they're not getting what they want, is they just want to shut it down. They want, <clears throat> I think, in my opinion, they just want to th be the wrecking ball of Congress. And the more they can destroy, the better for it. And, and part of that will be, you know, Biden. That's part of the agenda. But uh, I think it's democracy and the republic itself that they're aiming for. Uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I find it uh, adolescent. You know, they, they, they're going to tear the whole house down just to be able to stamp their feet and have a little fit. Um, and and, and looking, looking for attention, Tim. They're looking for attention. And what does that remind you of? That reminds you of Trump. That reminds you that Trump is really the one who's giving him the signals. Um, it's not even a dog whistle. He's telling them straight out what to do, and they're doing it. And, and they're all acolytes. Um, they are be completely proselytized, and they don't uh, exercise any independent thought or any concern for the country. Uh, or the Republican Party, for that matter, they're just following Trump's signals. But I, but I, I blame Trump for having elevated these guys and having created the Freedom Caucus and and this kind of insanity. It reminds me of uh, um, the inmates at the uh, asylum of Sharon Dunn. Uh, the inmates are running the asylum here. How do they get into that position? Well, you know, Trump has some skills in, in, in putting them together and making them as powerful as they are somehow. But, but they're all nothing, all of them, all the ones you mentioned in the Freedom Caucus and the rest of them, they're all nothing. They have no idea what public policy is. They have no idea what they swore an oath to do. They have no idea about protecting the country. And when they stand there in front of all these American flags, claiming by Im implication to be patriotic. They're not in the least patriotic. They're adolescents stamping their feet and having a little fit. Um, mm -hmm. I find it amazing that the American democracy is running up against this brick wall. You know, I, I would agree that, you know, we could easily point a finger at the obvious, and that is these you know, five knuckleheads that uh, have no sense of uh, an oath to office to the Constitution. Um, they're off. Their oath is to Donald Trump, which is very similar to what people do for dictators. They, they, they file a, an allegiance to the individual and not to the principles behind the nation, uh, the rule of law or the Constitution. So um, it's easy to point a finger at these guys. Um, what about the enablers? 
I'm thinking of Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham, who knows better, who knows the rule of law, who knows the Constitution inside and out. He used to be a JAG attorney, um, used to be, you know, right hand friend and, and, and advisor with John McCain, who would roll in his grave right now if he saw what was going on with the House and the GOP party and how it's turned into this MAGA um, Trump worship group. Um, you know, he just said recently, um, putting our military at risk doesn't help anything. He's referring to uh, Tuberville, Senator Tuberville, and the uh, withholding of promotions. So we have people like Lindsey Graham who come in and out of supporting the mega GOP, then criticizing the mega GOP on almost every issue. Uh, yet when there's an outrageous uh, comment or behavior that's um, you know reported in the news, he's silent. He's actually mum. He doesn't raise objections. He goes, well, I just don't want to comment on something like that. Uh, what do we do about these enablers? It's, you know, it's seven years into it now, uh, six years uh, into these enablers that have allowed the, the mega GOP to take the party over. What do we say about these enablers? You know, you remind me of an incident that happened years ago. Uh, I was uh, sitting with a guy who was somewhat political in the, in the Plaza Club in the Pioneer Plaza having lunch. And a sitting legislator in the state house, state senate, came over to us and said, you know, I haven't, I haven't been able to garner any interest um, from the public, from the newspapers, uh, the media, and thus uh, from my constituents in my district. Um, do you guys have any suggestions about how I could make a splash and garner some interest by my constituents and the media? I said, what kind of a stupid question is that? Make a splash? How about actually doing some constructive policy? How about addressing the issues that concern our community? But that's the, distinct, that's the distinction. Um, they're not looking to address the issues that confront the country. They're looking to make a splash. And that's what I think in large part drives them. Um, so uh, including, especially including Lindsey Graham, because you couldn't count on him for sticking with what he said yesterday till today and till tomorrow. I mean, he's a chameleon. He's a chameleon that changes colors while you watch instantaneously. Um, he's not the only one, but he's, he's a clear example of that. So what you have is people in Congress who want to stay in Congress. Uh, what you have is people who are making enough money, getting enough perks, or maybe maybe some graft and corruption too, who knows. Um, and they want to continue that. And they're not there, you know, to serve the country or to perform the obligations of their oath. Uh, I, I don't know what to say about that, Tim. I, I would say that they're misguided, misinformed, miseducated, and um, they have no idea what they're doing. And somehow the uh, machinery in this country has allowed them to get elected. And part of that is the strange connection between money and votes. You know, in the old days, uh, when Mr. Smith went to Washington, it wasn't, it wasn't about, um, you know, money. It was about being, saying the right thing, doing the right thing, being a, a person of character and consistency. But we don't care about that anymore. You can take a, you could take a, 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 the side of a cow and elect them to Congress, and nobody would know the difference. Uh, one more story, and I'll stop. When I got into high school, okay, they had the student organization elections, and, and all the girls on the cheerleading squad were dancing for him. His, his name was Chester Bruschi. He was by far the most popular candidate for president of the student organization. And uh, there were, um, you know, mimeograph sheets all over the, the walls and everywhere in the high school, um, you know, extolling his virtues. And everybody was so convinced this guy was so popular and so talented, they had a vote for him. They never actually asked a question of what he stood for or whether they had ever met him, but they voted for him. And he won in a sweeping landslide. And at the end of that election, when the dean of the school went around looking for him, looking for Chester Bruschi, does that name make you a little suspicious? <laughs> Since I like to drink Bruskies now and then, yes. Well, that was the point. 
Uh, they couldn't find him. There was no Chester Brewski. The machinery in the high school elected him, even though he did not exist. And, and I think you could elect the side of a cow in Congress, and he would be completely unqualified, completely incompetent, and completely inappropriate. For that matter, he doesn't have to exist. We just package him. And we get all those consultants and media experts and all that. We elect him even if he is the side of a cow. And I think Congress is filled with the side of a cow. Well, or Chester Bruski's. A, a, a gaggle of them. Yeah. You know, Jay, I want to bring up a name here because uh, he look just at, announced... Look at George DeSantos, huh? Okay. Uh, no, definitely no, at Chester Brewski. He could be lying his way into office, you know? Yeah, I haven't heard about him much lately, but I've been gone. Um, let me throw out a name here that announced that he was leaving the Senate. Um, a voice for the last six years of what I would call um, um, the old GOP of politics a voice of ethics, a voice of trying to work with the other side to get things done, to put in policies that are for the betterment of the American public. And that would be Mitt Romney. Um, on his swan song uh, interview, in his, I think it was in his office, um, he didn't have a lot of good things to say about the Republican Party anymore. He didn't have anything certainly good to say about Donald Trump. And uh, he basically, in his five to 10 minute interview, um, said Donald Trump is the source of all problems for the GOP and the acolytes, which you refer to, the the lackeys of the, of the GOP, the mega GOP. Uh, any thoughts about Mitt Romney leaving the Senate? He still has a year left um, before he, he exits. Do uh, you think he can do anything in his one short year of tenure? Well, first, I don't think that much of him. Because he was, he, was, he was trying to suck up to Trump for a long time. He thought True. that that was True. his way to, way to power, and so he he's a man who is not consistent. He may have moments of clarity, and maybe this soundbite was um, you know a positive statement. He's again. one of one who voted for his impeachment. Yeah. Okay. All right. But but I, I don't think Romney has done what we needed. I don't think Romney ever did really have the ability to lead this country, even though he. He had hoped to a couple times. That's one thing. But the other thing is, um, you know, you, you, you see him dropping out and you say, why? This guy has an appetite for political power. Why is he dropping out? And it's, you know, it's because he can't get anywhere. Because he thinks he's going to be attacked by the Trump faction for having attacked them. It's that same thing that, uh, you know, Ann Applebaum wrote in The Atlantic in that really important article when she, she made a parallel between the, the Trump mechanisms and the mechanisms of the communists, including Vladimir Putin, uh, in post-war Eastern Europe, uh, where they were afraid to leave. And they had these incredible rationalizations. If I stay around, maybe I can do something. Or if I leave... Um, I will lose my power and my perks. Um, and in the case of Romney, I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know exactly why he's leaving, uh, but I'm suspicious that it's, it's for self-interest rather than benefit of the country. If he cared for the country, he would stay around and do stuff and be a voice for rationality, but he's not doing that. He's leaving it open. And maybe it's because the, um, you know, the, 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 the Trump, faction uh, told him he has to get out now and they want to elect someone else or appoint someone else in his stead. I don't know what it is. And he, it's time. His time is up. And so somebody is bossing him around. That's a possibility. <clears throat> Suffice to say that uh, um, I don't think it's a great loss because I think he's been inconsistent and he has not demonstrated the badges of leadership uh, that he might have. You know, at the beginning of the show, I mentioned some sp specific things that look like uh, wrecking ball activity against the federal government and or um, things that are just out of the norm to impeach somebody out of the midair uh, without any evidence. By the way, today's the trial, I think, for the first uh, impeachment hearing. And those who are appearing uh, don't <laughs> are not connected to any point of testimony for evidence. That's kind of odd. <clears throat> so let me ask you this question, Jay. 
what is the overreaching goal of the mega GOP at this point? Is it is it to destroy the democracy as we know it, or is it just to make Biden look bad so that he doesn't become president, or is it a combination of, of multiple things that we haven't mentioned yet in this program? It's those two things. It's a combination of what you mentioned, you know, um, the, the, pull the rug out from under Biden on everything, attack him on everything. It's also to destroy the government as we know it. Uh, I mean, I, as I said, that you connect the dots, that's what you get. But the third thing, which you didn't mention, is to get Trump back in office no matter what. And um, they're responding to Trump. You know, it's interesting that he's part of the formula for the phenomenon that she described. Um, and that uh, without him, if he was off the stage for any reason, query whether that formula would continue to exist, whether they would continue to do these bizarre and destructive things. <clears throat> but I think it's all three, Tim. Um, it's destroying the democracy because they don't know or care about that. Uh, they figure their prospects are better if there is no democracy. Uh, it's uh, attacking Biden so he doesn't get votes. And it's elevating Trump to another term. Those three things. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with serving the country. Well, let's take the temperature of the GOP here on, on an example I want to bring out. You know, we have uh, Senator Menendez, who has some very serious criminal charges. Uh, he's, been, he's now indicted. And uh, you have seen a chorus of Democrats in the Senate, outside the Senate, call for his immediate resignation. Uh, saying that this is not good for the party and it's not good for the country with these type of allegations. Uh, we just had a New York judge uh, tell Trump that you are nothing but a fraud and you are guilty of fraud. I mean, we'll have the formal trial on Monday, but since it's a bench, a bench uh, decision from one judge and no jury trial, uh, it's just a matter of how much he's going to have to pay the state of New York. And yet we hear crickets from every member of the GOP about this judge's decision that he is guilty of, of fraud, financial fraud and fraud against the state of New York. Um, does that illustrate it any better of where we are between the Democrats and the Republicans as far as taking responsibility for their own? No, I think you make a good point. Um, Menendez uh, has to go and the, the Democrats are being honest and fair and square. And uh, he has no, he hasn't been tried, and I suppose he could get off like he did the last time. Um, but but there seems to be plenty of evidence in that indictment to suggest that he did it, just as he did the last time with a hung jury. Um, so um, I think that's to the credit of the Democratic Party that they're honest and they they're living in another time, a time when character and honesty were more important to members of Congress. Um, but the Republicans are always going to deny. They're going to deny the truth. This is what we should That's have not the old Republicans. I mean, I remember Republicans standing up and saying, enough's enough. I remember um, when all the pages were being molested by uh, both Democrat and Republican senators and representatives. Both parties spoke up and said, this is an outrage. Get out. Uh, and they did. They were successful of rooting out these bad uh, politicians who were preying on high school and uh, early college, uh, you know, interns. You know, it's changed. The Republican Party is not what you remember it to be and what I remember it to be. It's not a, a kind of mirror image, an other side of the aisle um, identity as, as the Democrats. They, they retain this historical quality that they have and demonstrate in the case of Menendez. But the Republicans are all together. The wagons are circled. They're all lined up and they're all going to tell lies and deny the, the truth and enable those who tell lies and deny the truth. Not, not every single one of them. But frankly, if I was a Republican, I'd find a way to get off that um, that approach. I'd I'd switch or I'd get out um, uh, or or I'd I'd speak up. I'd say, these people are out of their minds. What about their oath of office? Um, they denied the truth. And that's what made it possible to knock off the first impeachment and the second impeachment. That's what made it possible for Trump to do all his bizarre things and gutting the government and all the machinations in the Oval Office. And, you know, denying the election, the insurrection. It's the enablers that let him do that. And the enablers 
primarily, if not exclusively, GOP. So over the past few years, the GOP has been gutted. It has changed completely. It's like when they stand in front of a 27 American flags. It doesn't mean they're patriotic. It doesn't mean that they stand for the principles of the Republican Party as we used to know it. They're a different lot now, and they're masquerading as Republicans. You know, moving forward into the election season of 2024, do we see what you just said um, as a primary communication piece or slogan about the oath of office and uh, care to the republic and care to the constitution? Does that become a major uh, issue of this election coming up? Or is it pushed in the background and uh, something else takes the day, like the economy? Or uh, to what degree will... Um, your loyalty to the oath of office and, and preservation of the republic uh, be a, a major issue of this 2024 campaign. It is for you and me, you know, and, and to a lot of Democrats, but it's one hand clapping. The Republicans aren't going to take that position. They'll distract and deny and, you know, they'll avoid the issue. Um, and they'll be talking about how. Hunter Biden is a bad person, and, and Joe Biden didn't get anything done. Um, they'll be talking about all the issues um, that try to make him look bad. They will not be talking about preserving the republic. They will not. I promise you that. I'll bet you money that. You won't, you won't hear a word from them about that because they don't care about that. Uh, they care about knocking Biden off out of, out of office. So Does it become have, a main talking point for the Democrats? Yeah, but the Democrats are, are frankly weak. They're not well organized. They don't know how to present their views. Um, we talked while you were traveling, we talked about the, the platforms of the various parties. And the Democratic platform gives you eye strain, and it's not really persuasive to the average person uncommitted in this very, very long national Democratic platform. Um, there's not enough discussion about that very issue about saving the country. There's no discussion about the fact that we are in a, 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 a democratic five-alarm fire. Um, the, the word Ukraine is mentioned like once. Even the word Trump, they should be out there telling, telling us what's really going on here. And they're not. They're not well led. Sorry. And that could cost them the election and because Biden is uh, so uh, passive on so many things. Um, he's not able to light a fire among the American electorate. You know, um, you mentioned in a couple of sentences uh, the Democratic Party in a pretty good summer, summarization. That's weak, disorganized, and uh, pa dispassionate leadership. Uh, to what degree do we see... Um, the Calvary riding over the hill uh, called the Lincoln Project. They were very influential in the 2020 midterm elections. Uh, they were quite effective in that election. Uh, do, they, do they come back up as a shining star for the Democrats and actually make some inroads as far as how people are thinking about the country, the Constitution, and the rule of law? Very subjective, Tim. And, and there's this guy, I think his name is Schmidt. Um, he's very good on the Lincoln yeah. Project. And I see him once in a while, not necessarily as a representative of the Lincoln Project, but as someone who is a really good speaker and who can, you know, tell it like it is. But the Lincoln Project itself has lost its mojo, um, where, you know, before, for the last, um, the midterms, I guess, um, you saw a lot of that. And for the 2020 election, um, you saw a lot of that, a lot of Lincoln Project. And it was impressive to see Republicans get up there and tell the truth. And, uh, you know, um, I enjoyed that just for the, the fact that there were some Republicans who felt that way. But I don't see them anymore. Seems like they run out of gas or money or both. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure they're going to make a difference in 2024. Sorry. Okay. Uh, you know, last question. I think we're out of time. Um, how much more mayhem, other than the things we've talked about and I've listed in the, part of, the first part of the show, how much mayhem and against our government, 
does the mega P, mega GOP get away with? And what what future attempts do you see on their horizon? Well, once in a while, you see an article written. Usually, it's an opinion piece, um, a uh, a thought piece um, about what happens if Trump or the like win, and representative government is undone. Which we're in the process now of having that happen around us. And I don't think, I don't understand why, but I don't think that people understand what it means to lose democracy. They don't understand what life is like in terms of their own civil rights, their own opportunities, um, their ability to get information about what the government is doing or not doing, and therefore what the government is doing to help and save and protect them. Um, I, I guess, I don't know if law school helps, but certainly history helps to see what happened in Eastern Europe back after the war, to see what's happening now in Putin's Russia. Um, the fact is that if we lose this, our lives on this planet are going to be very different and we won't like it. Um, I think the most scary aspect of it is is the children. Just as um, Putin has kidnapped thousands of children into Russia. What do you think he does with them? He puts them in little Russian uniforms and in a classroom with a teacher who teaches them, this is on the record, who teaches them how to hate Ukraine and thus how to hate their parents and thus how to hate the culture they came from. That's what, that's what Hitler did. He recreated you know, the generations. And I think the scariest thing that we face is not only the loss of the media, the loss of free expression, um, the loss of civil rights as preserved in the Constitution or as articulated in the Constitution, not necessarily preserved. Um, what, what I worry about is when the kid goes to school and the teacher says, you know, if your parents are talking down the Freedom Caucus, you have to tell us. Mm -hmm. You have to come report them. And if your colleagues and your bosses are talking down the GOP and the MAGAs and Trump, you have to come and tell us. And then what happens is the government is used as a weapon focused on anybody who is reporting. And that's the scariest part of all if you lose freedom of speech, democracy, representative government. And I think people don't realize it, but I think that's where we're headed. All right. We'll leave it right there, Jay, because those are wise words to end with and uh, certainly food for thought. And I hope everyone listening to this show actually considers your words and thinks hard on them. So with that, I'd like to thank you, Jay Fidel, for being my co-host on this show. Uh, join us next week for American Issues Take One. And I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And until then, aloha.